We are deeply honored by this immense and completely unexpected award. Along with my co-awardee, Shelley Taylor, I'm grateful for their generosity and vision of the BBVA Foundation in establishing these awards, as well as the hard work of the nominators and selectors in recognizing the importance of science to society. We hope to represent the social sciences well in their inaugural year of this Inclusion in the Frontiers Awards, because our work reflects the contributions not just of our labs, but of whole fields of research that we brought together. We appreciate our particular award's recognition of the multidisciplinary inventive integration. In synthesis, there is creativity. New ideas grow not just at the center of normal science, but also at the periphery, where one field of science overlaps another. The intellectual freedom to combine insights from neighboring fields requires a willingness to risk a look over the edge, maybe with equal parts imagination and innocence, equal parts rebellion and reinvention. Respecting the persistent scientific challenges, but viewing them from more than one epistemic perspective takes a calculated risk because the territory is beyond the map, so you define the map as you go. Even if you draw the map, maybe no one else will follow, choosing instead to stay in their home field. Despite the risk, the potential rewards are great, both conceptually and empirically. Let me illustrate. Our 1984 book, Social Cognition, in effect founded a field. Its topic is how people make sense of each other. This everyday experience of forming impressions turns out to be a miracle of sorts. People infer each other's unobservable predispositions from their behavior in context. Human behavior is a complicated phenomenon to interpret. Behavior is inherently ambiguous, unreliable, noisy signal. But it's the social perceiver's main basis for inferring another person's mood, attitudes, intent, personality traits. The perceiver's challenge of mind reading requires insight from two fields in psychological science. Social psychology, which studies face-to-face -face interactions, and cognitive psychology, which studies human information processing. Having to integrate different approaches to the same phenomena sharpens the analysis. Eclectic sources allow the scientists to choose the best theoretical frameworks and the most precise tools for the problem at hand. The project began around 1980 when a psychology department head invited a new assistant professor to write a book for his prestigious series, capturing the emerging field at the nexus of cognitive science and social psychology. This was an intriguing challenge because young faculty were beginning to teach this topic, and certainly lots of people were investigating it. So these were exciting times. But the field had no coherent framework, and in my field, junior faculty were not supposed to write books. Undaunted, the assistant professor, me, invited her advisor, Taylor, to co-author the book, a fortunate choice because the first edition had more than 1,100 references. Fortunately, also, Taylor specialized in the adaptive role of positive illusion, excessive optimism, sense of control, and self-confidence. These were useful illusions in completing the project. Fisk specialized in biases and how teamwork can overcome them, also useful here. Altogether, collaboration was advisable. But the risk was great and the outcome uncertain. The goal was combining cognitive and social psychology to see how people think about people. This was a challenge because the two fields have different norms and sensibilities. Cognition lends itself to a keen focus on specific processes of thinking, attention, memory, inference. For example, how many units can a typical person hold in mind, classically seven plus or minus two? Online resources have limited bandwidth in the short-term moment. We coined the term cognitive miser to express this meta-theory. Limited capacity human thinkers will develop shortcuts to reason, for example, about pandemic contagion. Instead of reading all the details of each new study, one might follow the advice of a trusted, respected authority. Instead of reading the demographics about who's contagious, one might follow one's guts feel gut feeling about who is contaminated, for example, strangers rather than family. Suddenly, the problem is not just cognition, but social cognition. Determining who is contagious, trustworthy, or expert, these are not simple judgments but people judge each other all the time. In contrast to the cognitive approach of breaking the problem down into small pieces, social judgment requires looking at the whole person. What happens when the limited capacity processor meets a whole complicated human? 
It takes shortcuts, but in this case, stereotypes. Cognitive misers simplify the world into in-groups that are on their side with warm intent and out-groups who are not trustworthy. Besides, warm people judge these groups as competent to act on their intent or not. For example, scientists are viewed as competent but not so warm. Old people are viewed as warm but not so competent. Refugees are stereotyped as neither. Like other cognitive shortcuts, these stereotypes persist because they're efficient, useful, even if inaccurate or unfair. This cognitive approach to, to prejudice suggests the normality of categorizing people into groups and judging them by stereotypes. Social cognition research like this has exploded over the 40 years since we wrote the first edition, growing from 508 pages to 658 pages in the 2021 edition, and now including applications to health, education, organizations, politics, and more. In all these settings, people must make sense of each other in order to survive and thrive. We were lucky to be writing the first overview to define the field. In reviewing this work, we had three aims. To report conveying the science accurately, to synthesize disparate ideas and results, and to entertain showing how fun it is to solve puzzles about people. The question was whether we could succeed. In the short term, many were skeptical, including my own department at the time. Gradually, the book became a favorite resource. More than 20,000 citations later, the book received, receiving this award from the BBVA Foundation affirms that it, taking the risk did advance the science for the greater good. Thank you.